Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the November 20th, 2019 board meeting to order and remind everyone to please use your microphones when speaking and turn them off when you're finished. Thank you. Commissioners present are Commissioner Doan, Commissioner Duggan, Commissioner Schmidt, Commissioner Sanders, and myself, Commissioner Bagnall. First thing on the agenda is reports by the Chief Executive Officer and Management Staff. Good evening. Uh, so um, in just a bit, I'm going to have uh, Clark Balfour prevent our safety minute, uh, go through that. But first, I'm going to just run through the department report, and then I'll turn it over to you. Okay. <laughs> so uh, in just a, a bit after uh, Clark is done presenting the uh, safety minute, um, I'm going to give a department report uh, really tied around what we presented um, last week uh, for our management retreat and the exercise we went through. I think it's important for the board to see what we're doing and where we're headed tied to the strategic plan. Uh, on uh, Portland Cryptosporidium results, uh, the city of Portland reported that a total of six Cryptosporidium osis were detected in select water samples collected from the Bull Run Headworks between October 22nd and November 10th. Uh, the Oregon Health Authority has determined that the public does not need to take additional protections at this time. Uh, complete results of Portland's cryptosporidium monitoring are posted on the Water Bureau's website. Um, I wanted to report that I had the opportunity to attend uh, what's called the Isle Utilities uh, Technical Workshop. Last week, it was a one-day workshop up in Seattle, uh, and it was with utilities from across the Northwest. Uh, this is a relatively new. Uh, it, it's a it's a firm, and it's ba it's a subscription-based firm, um, and they really are doing something quite unique. And they had invited me to participate in one of their forums, um, where they're looking at all of the emerging technologies that are coming out in the water sector, um, and they have hubs worldwide. So they're looking at new emerging technologies from across the world and then they select uh, about 200 of these, tech, or I'm sorry, 30 technologies uh, a year out of about 200 that they evaluate and then they bring them to these regional forums um, to have the vendors actually come in, do a presentation on their the, what they are offering. Um, give us a chance to do some Q&A, then those people step out of the room, and the utilities then have a pretty robust discussion about, is this real, is it applicable, um, how would you use this, what's the value of it, and, and a lot of really important discussion is uh, utilities who've had similar experience with similar technologies. So it's, it's a pretty valuable thing, and, and becoming a subscriber to it, um, what it would allow us to do is actually access all of the prior um, analysis that they've done in prior technologies that they've already evaluated. So um, this is something that uh, Clean Water Services is a member of, um, and Seattle Public Utilities. Uh, there's many, many up and down the West Coast, um, so this is something I'm going to be looking to probably get us involved in, um, just because some of the technologies that they had presented even while I was sitting there were of interest to us um, and what we may be looking at doing. So uh, I, I was really impressed with it, and I think it's a, a pretty um, interesting approach to it that it really separates the vendor, so the vendor doesn't contribute money, so there's no it's it's a uh, you get to hear from the vendor and the vendor's gone so um no, no quid pro quo there is no quid pro quo <laughs> uh and then uh i just wanted to let uh the board members know we did a staff presentation to um the regional uh forum this what was it monday morning um, on our uh, project on the WWSP, so it was myself, Dave Kraska, uh, Nikki Iverson from Hillsborough, and Mayor Doyle from Beaverton. 
Um, Dave gave the majority of the presentation, uh, but it was really well done um, and I think well received. We had a lot of good questions. Uh, Commissioner Schmidt was there, and uh, it was great to have uh, some friendly eyes in the audience, but uh, I thought it overall was really good and, and a good chance for us to get more information out there about the project. Um, the other one is I had a meeting with um, Portland Community College Climb Center for Advancement on Monday morning. Um, this was uh, not, it ended up being a one-on-one. -on -one. It was supposed to be a group um, to talk to them about ideas um, of ways that they could help us. So I ended up having a rather long discussion with them about how we could create, uh, forgive the pun, a pipeline um, <laughs> uh, of talent, new and future talent to us as a district. Um, so different types of training programs, uh, certification programs that they could offer that could then be people that we'd be interested in attracting to come work for us. So we're at the very beginning of that discussion. Um, they said they'd be inviting me back sometime in January to have more discussion um, as they build their, their plan uh, around this. Uh, and then the other is the employee auction. If you've been out in the uh, hallway, um, uh, as a reminder, the board and public are invited to attend the employee auction to be held tomorrow uh, at 7 a.m., bright and early. Uh, that'll be held here in this boardroom. Uh, this is a great opportunity to raise funds to benefit our communities. Uh, this year's charity beneficiaries include TVWD's Customer Emergency Assistance Program, Randall Children's Hospital, and Make-A-Wish Foundation. Uh, the board is also invited to attend the upcoming staff holiday luncheon on December 19th at noon in the boardroom. And then a uh, couple last items here. Um, there's uh, two that I kind of knew, so I'm going to add those to the list. So forgive me that they aren't on this. But uh, the first off is uh, my schedule. So I'll be uh, in Central Oregon for the week of Thanksgiving uh, with my family. Uh, so just, uh, I've, got, I, I've appointed AICs. I will be available uh, Monday through Wednesday by phone and email and checking those, um, certainly. But uh, we'll be spending that week with my family uh, for Thanksgiving week. Um, and wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving holiday. Um, and then uh, the other things that I wanted to mention, um, we went through, we as the management team went through the um, upcoming meetings. And as we reviewed the upcoming meetings, we were looking at the December 3rd work session. Um, and there's only one topic and it's not a critical topic. It's not something that is pressing. <clears throat> so, what I'm proposing, not wanting to waste your time, commissioners' times, um, I'm proposing that we uh, cancel that work session and we'll just move that one item to another work session where, where there's a little more substance to it. So if you're agreeable to that, I'd like to suggest canceling the December 3rd. Yes? I am seeing five head nods. <laughs> okay, great. Um, my staff thanks you, so. <laughs> um, and then uh, the other one I, I wanted to mention, um, some of you may have heard about this. On Sunday night, I was contacted um, by Nikki Iverson. There's been a main break on the south transmission line um, from the JWC. Uh, they've uh, had to shut down the line uh, to make this repair. It's still shut down. Um, we, nobody's out of service. Everybody's still been kept whole, so uh, everything's fine from that perspective. Um, I, I know they have a construction crew out on site. Um, it's a pretty significant break. Uh, saw some uh, pretty disturbing pictures and videos of the whole thing. Um, so the, the, uh, really what's concerning is kind of why it failed and, and are there other spots in the line that um, have similar vulnerabilities. 
um, but it, it's clear a whole chunk of the concrete looks like broke away, and it does look like it broke away that with some tap that they thought was oddly placed. So as you know, this is a 1970s line, so I don't think they're certain, at least the last I heard of what that tap was for or, or who put it there. So, um, but those are things that uh, they're looking at now. Uh, I don't know, uh, Carrie, I'm gonna look to you if we have a time and date that that's gonna come back online. Um, based on the latest information that we know of, we think that the repair will be all completed by either tonight or early tomorrow and the system should be back on um, online before the weekend is up. And I'll just note one more thing. Um, one of the activities or projects that JWC is engaging as we speak, um, we just um, got a scope of work um, completed to get moving forward with um, condition assessment for this particular line. So it was kind of coincidental that the re um, leak was detected in the line that we were um, planning to do additional condition assessment on. Because of the event, we've taken this as an opportunity to um, bring the consultant on board sooner than what it had planned for. And they were out there, um, was able to take additional cell samples to do some um, corrosive analysis for the future conditions, as well as um, place a um, CP station so that for um, future purposes, we'll be able to um, make some measurements on corrosivity in the area. So while it's not an ideal situation and we're trying to take the best use out of the um, current repair and um, I'm working with the consultants on that. Is this concrete cylinder pipe? Yes. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over for the safety moment to Clark Balfour. Okay, well, good evening. So it is safety moment time. Let's see if we can get something going here. You got it? Well, here we go. Well, we should go back. Can we go back one? Which way is going? No, I don't know. Uh, it says on, yes. All right, let's try this again. So, I, I probably should have had a quiz that the, uh, <laughs> probably should have had a quiz that when, when you see the words deadly, what do you think of? Well, you think of carbon monoxide, and that's our safety moment for tonight because it is getting into winter and events like this happen. So, let's see if this works now. There you go. So, <clears throat> well, as we said, it's, it's deadly. And why is that? It's because it's odorless, colorless, silent. It affects everybody equally. So often, you know, you get into public health warnings and they talk about people that are, uh, you know, Im immunosystem compromised, um, you know, elderly, young, that sort of thing. This one hits everybody the same. And 20,000 people a year go to the, to the ER, 4,000 are actually retained and hospitalized, and 400 people die. And, and here's two headlines from the Oregonian just recently. Uh, over near the Dalles, a couple people die in a, in a camping trailer. And then uh, this one, the school bus apparently um, <clears throat> had a, a carbon monoxide leak and it was parked next to the school building, went in through the windows and kids started to get sick. So we need to be careful. <clears throat> so what are the cause and source? It's, it's burning fuel in a confined space. And, and these are the typical culprits that we have, vehicles, small engines, gas stoves, ranges, grills, lanterns, generators, and furnaces. So <clears throat> prevention, okay, winter is the high risk time and that's, that's why it's your topic tonight as we're heading into that season. So what can you do? Um, those CO detectors that are run on batteries just like your smoke detector, those are great things to have. Things that may seem to be um, very apparent, don't warm up your car in the garage. Well. 
that's even you know certainly with, with not with your door closed that's that would not be a good choice but um, even if you have the door open don't warm it up in your garage it th this builds up in confined spaces and doesn't dissipate very quickly so have things out in the open uh, check all of your gas burning appliances each year um, if you have a portable generator make sure you run it outside and make sure that you have separation from your from your home uh, don't use any portable flameless chemical heaters indoors try not to open up the gas oven and use that to heat the place and then check your chimney um, so what are your symptoms so we have low to moderate exposure these are some of the categories that come from some of the literature they actually had death in high level exposure i think that's uber high level exposure so i gave it its own category but if you're in uh, low to moderate, headache, fatigue, shortness of breath, nausea, dizziness, high level, now it's really starting to affect you. You're confused, you're losing coordination, you lose consciousness. Uh, what, what do you do? Get outside. Call 911, account for everyone, but don't go back in until the premises get the all clear. So with that, that concludes the safety moment. So uh, I'd like to give an update now on uh, the what we did in uh, leadership retreat uh, here on November 6th and 7th and talk about what the future is of that. So um, we did what's called DISC profiling. Um, so what is DISC? Uh, DISC is a behavioral assessment tool. Uh, it's designed to help people understand themselves and others in areas of communication, habits, and preferences. Uh, DISC provides a common language for people to adapt their communication styles to others, and it is a practical, practical approach to improve the quality of the workplace environment, relationships, uh, and results. Um, so this is a tool I had used prior. Uh, I had great success with it and uh, thought it would be a great thing to introduce here um, to help us all kick off with, with me in this new position um, to, for everyone, one, to get to know my style, but more importantly for me to get to know everyone else's style and how to work best together. So um, what are the workplace principles? So uh, DISC uh, it identifies behavioral tendencies in a given environment. So our disc tendencies at home are not the same as what we use at work. They're, they're different. Uh, there is no right or wrong disc profile. So anywhere on the disc that anyone is, that's good. It, it doesn't mean if you're one thing or another, it doesn't mean it's good or bad. Um, in fact, a healthy organization is well distributed across the, the DISC spectrum, um, and, and which is the organization needs all the profiles to succeed. Uh, DISC is not a method to label oneself or others, nor is it an excuse or a weapon. So we don't get to use uh, our, what it shows us individually what we are. We don't get to say, well, sorry, you gotta put up with me because that's just the way I am. It's not how it works. Um, this is about understanding that you might have a certain tendency to commute one, uh, one way and that you, you need to be thinking about that when you're communicating with others. Um, and then everyone is a blend of all four styles, but people, people gen, gen, generally tend strongly towards one or two styles. In some cases, uh, three styles. Um, so here's a illustration of the model. So um, you can see the D is uh, indicated by dominance. Um, those types of styles are direct, they're results oriented, they're firm, they're strong willed, they tend to be forceful individuals. Uh, influence, the I, um, they tend to be outgoing, enthusiastic, optimistic, highly spirited and lively. Uh, the S, uh, steadiness, uh, tend to be even-tempered, accommodating, patient, humble, tactful people. 
And then lastly, conscientious, uh, analytical, reserved, precise, private, systematic. So those are, the, in general, the styles. So um, taking this a little bit fur further, and this can be uh, misleading, I believe, when you first look at this. As you look to the left side of the disk profile, you see that folks on, that tend to be on that half of it, they tend to be task-oriented. And it says unfavorable. That doesn't mean it's an unfavorable trait. It just means that um, they tend to have um, traits of skepticism. So they don't look at everything's possible. They, they question things. That's a healthy thing. That's, you want people that are questioning things. So that, that's the people that fall more on the left-hand side of the profile. On the right-hand side of the profile, um, you get that things. It's more people-oriented, um, and not so much task-oriented. And they view things very favorably. Um, so they have a very optimistic view of things and uh, and of what's possible. So where did we all fit um, as a management team and supervisors? Um, so. Uh, we will eventually roll this out through the entire staff. Um, so this was our first cut at it. Um, and uh, this is where we all fit. We, we decided not to put people or individual names up there because some people weren't totally comfortable with their names up there. Um, but what I will tell you is, is where I fell. So uh, I am the dot there at the top under administrative services. So uh, I'm considered an ID. So uh, those are my tendencies and traits um, on that side. Uh, I will tell you this is the second time I've taken this and the last time I was a DI. So um, my dot was on the other side of the line. So it does show as your position changes, um, as what your responsibilities are, you tend to change with it. So um, with, with that. And, but again, what I am, where my blind spots are, and I'm using myself as an exa example here, is if you go to the bottom of the S and C, um, all those people, I need to be listening very carefully to. Those people are covering my blind spots. Those are the areas where I may not see things as easily as they see things. So that just gives an illustration of why this is an important diagram, that we understand it so that we can see where our strengths are in to what we can do, but also understanding where our strengths are not and knowing that, hey, I better get uh, in my case, I better get some people from this side of the table and some from this side of the table to uh, come into some of my discussions and meetings to help balance out what I'm thinking. So I think it, it, that's part of the reason we're going, we, we've gone down this to understand that. So the other thing, so that was day one. Uh, that we spent doing. Day two, uh, we, it was just the management team. Uh, it wasn't the supervisory staff. Um, and what we looked at is change accountability framework. And there's different forms of this. There's actually a program that some of our staff have gone through for change management. Um, so this is a slight variation on that more formal process. Uh, but what this just shows is kind of the process that people go through in change. Me being a new CEO, I represent change. Um, so you people, when we go through change, we tend to start in disbelief. Um, we hope to work our way to opposition. And if we're doing well, we work our way into exploration and then hopefully investment. And so, but this is a normal cycle that we all go through and change. And so as we bring new things, as I suggest anything new to the district, this is an important thing for me to understand that what everyone else is going through as I suggest changes. This is, you know, I gotta look at where they're at on this diagram. I can't expect everybody to jump to investment from where I'm at today. 
Um, so, you know, it, it really, actually all the innovation that you see in any uh, firm uh, that's really being very innovative, where that's all happening is on that black line between opposition and exploration. That's where the innovation occurs. So again, um, these aren't negative and positive. This is about utilizing to our advantage where people are at. So when we have people in opposition working closely with people in exploration, we can actually get a lot of innovative thinking and creative ideas that come out of that. Um, so uh, we really wanted to understand this in part because I, as we move forward with the strategic plan that I mentioned at the last work session, what we'll be doing, um, I think it's important that we understand where staff will be in regards to this whole change frame uh, network. Um, and then uh, we obviously want to move the district uh, towards investment. Ultimately, that's where we want everybody to arrive at when it comes to our strategic plan. Um, and we'll be discussing how we will help people move from disbelief up into innovation uh, over the course of the coming months. So here's the timeline. So this is a little more detail from what I presented to you last time. Uh, between now and the end of this year, uh, the management team, we're going to review and prioritize our outstanding items that need attention uh, and determine messaging. So these are issues that a lot of people are talking about but we haven't resolved them, that they've kind of been lingering. Uh, they, they, they fit well in the kind of the categories of the rumor mill and create angst amongst uh, staff. So we're looking to address these quickly and start taking those off the table. Um, we're going to work with our direct reports to start talking about the disk profiles um, and identify the lessons that we learned as a management team um, into our leadership goals. So it's really about understanding how we can utilize and work with each other and use each other's strength. And then the, the other thing that we'll be doing here before the end of the year is creating a process um, to gain feedback from all the TVWD staff on what our mission, vision, and values are that feed into the strategic plan. So, um, you know, it's one of these things that, you know, I can have the best idea, I can have a great vision, but if nobody's behind it, if I'm the only one behind it, it's a very difficult task for me to implement. So this is about getting everybody behind uh, this whole strategic plan, and part of that is getting them to buy in on the mission and vision and the values that we use to get there. When we get to January, uh, we're going to create communication agreements uh, to work with our teams. So addressing the communication styles and then uh, communicate the entire opt-in process. What we mean by that um, is really getting all of the district staff um, opting in to, to actually weighing in on what should be our mission, vision, and values, and what do we want in our strategic plan. So we'll be starting that in January. Uh, February through May, um, we'll be, each department's going to be working with their teams um, to really uh, get that feedback process um, and then ultimately we'll be communicating that back with the entire organization, what we learned from every department. Um, we'll also be scheduling DISC sessions with the remaining TVWD staff. So the future uh, DISC sessions won't be day-long ones, They're, they'll be consolidated, so they'll be half-day sessions. We think four of those will get all the remaining staff, but again, we think it's important um, as a reset of communication um, as we move forward. June through July, uh, we're going to be sharing, uh, ultimately, uh, what the management team will do is take all the departments, individuals, uh, mission, vision, values, their, their kind of individual uh, strategic plans, consolidating them into what we believe the district's mission, vision, values, and what the district's strategic plan should entail. 
Um, and then we'll be bringing that back to staff um, and then ultimately uh, sometime uh, late uh, fall or late to early fall uh, next year, um, bringing that all back to the board. And the idea is, is that our strategic plan will encompass what we're doing now, what's already on our plate, um, and the resources that it's taking to get what's already on our plate done, and then show what remaining capacity we have to take on any new additional uh, ideas or goals that the board may want to, to embark on. So it gives the board a way to say, okay, um, we, we, we'd really like to see this other thing done that maybe won't be in our strategic plan that we've developed. And we can then have a dialogue with you in a meaningful way to say, so of the things that we already have on the plan, is there any of these that you would like to see come off? Or if you wanna get everything that we already have done, here's the additional resources that it would take to accomplish any additional goals. So I think it gives us a real metric to move forward. Ultimately, all of that will be incorporated into then the budgeting process that we kick off in uh, early 2021. We have a finalized strategic plan with a mission and vision that are all aligned um, so that our strategic plan is actually tied to uh, measurable outcomes of the mission and vision and then that's all incorporated into our budget document ultimately that gets adopted um, by June of 2021 and then that's when we're really embarking on getting that all done. So that's what we've been kicking off here this last week that's where we're headed. Um, so I, I'm the project owner of this uh, process. Uh, Dave Kraska said he had too much on his plate, so um, I couldn't kick it to him. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but no, I, I mean, this is my role, I, I believe, is to really set these, the mission and vision and the strategic plan to implement what the, what the board wants to accomplish, but also recognizing what we're already doing. So I think that's an important piece of this is that we have to capture in our strategic document what is it we're currently doing. Um, and before we start adding more on a plate, what else do we, what else, what do we got and what more can we take on with existing resources? So with that, I'm open to any questions. It's, uh, it, it, it looks very similar to Myers-Briggs. It has a lot of similarities, yes. Okay, so it's very similar, but not exactly alike. Yes. Okay. Other questions? All right, thank you for that. Brought back memories. <laughs> <laughs> we will now turn to Commissioner Communications and reports of meetings attended. And I think I'll start on my left with Commissioner Doan. Okay, it's been a, uh, a very interesting month our 30-day period, I spent five nearly complete days sitting in on an interview of the custom information system. It was quite enlightening. I had absolutely no idea how uh, involved the custom information system was, nor the, what, the detail that the staff had gone through to make sure that they pick the absolute best provider. Uh, and that took up four days. I went to a session uh, concerning the, the next hundred years in water resources put on by the state of Oregon. Uh, I went to the dedication of the Joint Water Commission expansion of the treatment plant, a work session on November 5th, and tonight's meeting. And that's it. Thank you. Commissioner Duggan. Uh, on uh, October 28th, there was a special meeting of the WWSS, Water Supply System meeting, where we had to get an IGA approved to meet a condition of uh, the city of Wilsonville's land use process. Um, 
On the 5th, I also attended the TVWD board workshop where we held an executive session and also got an update on our uh, Firefly uh, meter reading vehicle program. Um, on the 7th, uh, we had the regular meeting of the Willamette Water Supply System uh, where we um, approved uh, some um, change orders and updates to the uh, project. And then tonight's meeting. That's it. Thank you. Commissioner Sanders. <clears throat> on the 5th, uh, we had our um, monthly board work session. And on the 12th, uh, I attended the Willamette River Water Coalition um, quarterly meeting. And I guess uh, the information to share there with my colleagues is that um, we are going to a one meeting every three, every four months. So three meetings a year as a percentage of the responsibilities from WRWC have been handed off to, I believe, WWSS. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, some of those responsibilities have been handed off to the WWSS now, so there wasn't as, as much of a need for um, meetings at that, um, for that organization. And then uh, tonight's monthly board meeting. And Commissioner Schmidt. Uh, I attended four. On the third, I attended the public affairs forum in which uh, Chief Justice Martha Walters and presiding Judge Daniel Hensaker uh, talked about crime in Washington County. I have a couple of things here. I'll leave them on the table if anybody's interested. Uh, and then on the fifth, it was a work session that I attended. And then on the 18th, another public affairs forum. Uh, I don't know, some guys from some water, whatever. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's our CEO and Dave Kraska <laughs> uh, that entertained the public affairs forum. Uh, there were some good questions asked, and there were some good answers. And tonight's regular board. Thank you. I had a few meetings as well, <laughs> most of them the same ones other folks have mentioned, but one in particular I wanted to mention. On the 28th of October, I attended the Oregon Government Finance Officers Association to listen to their keynote presenter, Manny Teodoro, who was talking about ambition and innovation in government and how you encourage that in government. And that was a real interesting talk. He's a, a very well-known nationwide presenter and an old friend. On the 30th of October, I attended the Joint Water Commission plant dedication ceremony, got to turn a fake valve. It was very cool. <laughs> and, and had a really good tour of the plant. On the 5th, we had the board work session, talked about strategic planning, how much the operations group hates the fireflies, and I can't blame them. And also a really good update from Dave Kraska on the Willamette water supply system. On the 12th, I had a meeting with the CEO to do agenda planning, and then, of course, tonight's board meeting. So next item on the agenda is topics to be raised by commissioners. Do we have any topics? Seeing none, next portion of the meeting is public comment time, which is set aside for persons wishing to address the board on items that are on the consent agenda and matters not on the regular agenda. Additional public comment will be invited on agenda items as they are presented. Do we have any persons who would like to comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll turn to the consent agenda. Consent agenda items are considered to be routine and may be enacted in one motion without separate discussion. Any board member may request that an item be removed by motion for discussion and separate action. Any items requested to be removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion will be considered immediately after the board has approved those items which do not require discussion. There are three items on tonight's consent agenda. First is to approve the October 1st, 2019 work session minutes. The second is to approve the October 16th, 2019 regular meeting minutes. And lastly, approve the November 5th, 2019 work session minutes. Do I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 No opposed, the, mission pa the motion passes. The next item on the agenda is a public hearing. 
I have not received any comment forms, so I won't recite the rules about public hearing at this time, but if somebody is moved to, to testify, we'll remind them of what the rules are about this. So the reason for this public hearing is that we will, <coughs> acting as the local contract review board, we need to consider adopting resolution 28-19, which is a resolution declaring an exemption from competitive bidding for the Farmington Road booster pump station and discharge main project and authorize proceeding with a construction manager slash general contractor con type of contract. And we have a staff report from Andrew Barrett. Time here today. My name is Andrew Barrett. I'm a project engineer here. Um, so I'm going to present the Farmington Road booster pump station and discharge main projects. Um, let's see here. So the outline of my presentation, uh, I'm going to go through and um, the site and the route options for uh, the two projects. We're going to discuss, discuss uh, alternative delivery. Um, the evaluation and the results. Uh, we'll have a comment period and then uh, some board action. You can see in the lower right, uh, this is the property uh, we're gonna be talking about. It's at 209th and Farmington, uh, the project site there. Um, a couple of years ago, you guys approved uh, purchasing that property. Let's see here. Uh, overview of the whole district. Uh, you can see the yellow star essentially shows where that project site is at. Um, I've got some black lines shown um, where there's going to be, uh, there's three potential routes for the discharge piping. Uh, when you build a pump station, we have to have the discharge piping to actually pump to somewhere. So we're going up uh, from the intersection of 209th and Farmington up to the Cooper Mountain tanks. Uh, like I said, it's about 10,000 feet long. Each route, I mean, they're all within about 500 feet of each other in length. At this time, it's planned to be 16-inch piping. We're still doing some engineering modeling and design to ensure that that's the correct size. Some project background for the pump station. Um, you know, 2017, we purchased the project or the property. Uh, there's also the Willamette Water Supply System facility, which is a turnout and the water meter that is supposed to be sited on that particular site. Uh, I show a conceptual uh, site layout uh, that was part of the original uh, presentation. Um, the idea of the pump station at this facility is to actually provide a resilient facility to help pump up to the top of Cooper Mountain. Currently, there are two pump stations that act in series uh, to actually pump water to the top of Cooper Mountain. This one will get us all the way to the top. Uh, Right here, this is kind of a sneak peek. This is probably our five to 10% design stage uh, preliminary layout of the site. Uh, we've sort of condensed the building to be, uh, or condensed the two buildings we had shown on the previous slide. I'll go back. It's kind of hard to see there, but uh, into one building. We still have a lot of the same um, elements where we've got uh, two accesses to the site. Uh, we are working on um, ensuring that our layout is going to meet agency standards for a quick design and construction of the project. Um, now I'm going to move into just a quick uh, refresher on alternative delivery uh, projects and sort of a sneak peek at our evaluation here. Most of the time we deliver projects with the, the first circle you see on the left, which is the design bid build. It's, tra it's the traditional delivery method. It works very well for uh, projects that are relatively simple and straightforward. Um, there's individual relationships between the designer and the contractor with the water district. Another, all, another method would be the uh, construction manager at risk or um, cons uh, construction manager general contractor where we have a relationship with each party but we basically force the um, the construction manager, general contractor to actually work with the um, designer to ensure that the project that gets built uh, is as cost effective, uh, constructible, and is easy for um, uh, 
uh, it's easier for the contractor to build, which usually results in cost savings. Uh, progressive design build, that's where a contractor and a um, designer essentially team up together and have a contract with the um, with us, the owner, to deliver a project. And the last one is very similar, except for um, they actually provide a cost at the very start of the project. Um, so uh, we have evaluated these uh, potential contracting methods, and we believe that uh, CMGC is the most appropriate uh, delivery, me uh, delivery method for this uh, project. Uh, and the, some of the reasons why is it's a complex project. Uh, it's got fluoride, uh, fluoride injection. Uh, there's a pump station uh, with some very high pressures that we have to deal with. Uh, there, and there's an opportunity to make the project uh, and construction uh, easier by having the contractor provide feedback uh, as the design gets developed to help ensure that um, we keep costs down on our project. So. Another item to be noted, uh, pumps have a very long lead time, so to back up power supplies, we can actually um, go to bid early for those items and actually get quotes and prices uh, locked in uh, before we actually uh, deliver the rest of the project to help condense the um, project delivery timeline, the schedule. So, so why use alternative delivery? Um, I've kind of touched on a lot of these things. Uh, the biggest one is for complex projects. You get uh, contractor buy-in for the approach to the project, which usually uh, ensures that uh, you're going to, going to get a project delivered uh, in a cost-effective manner. Uh, there's also the potential for uh, risks to be allocated to the appropriate party, um, which um, does result in cost savings rather than pushing a certain risk that have costs associated uh, all onto the contractor that can make prices go up or all onto us that uh, can expose the district. This has a very clear line for um, uh, ensuring that the appropriate risk is allocated in the appropriate uh, location. The other good thing when the contractor is brought into the design portion of the project, they have buy-in for what the project actually is all about and they can help uh, assure that we actually meet the goals of the project and the project gets delivered uh, effectively. <clears throat> So, again, we're trying to move to the uh, alternative project. Uh, I'm sorry, we're trying to move to CMGC. Uh, the highlights are there's going to be a contract with a designer, uh, and then there's going to be, <clears throat> excuse me, a contract with the uh, uh, CMGC or the uh, general contractor. So one of the things to note is uh, we are going to need an exemption from the public bidding process, uh, but we do have uh, price negotiations uh, with this particular method. Uh, the designer is actually acting as a uh, owner's representative to help ensure that we are getting uh, competitive pricing. And with the negotiation, if we don't feel that we're getting a pe competitive pricing, we can actually uh, ask the uh, contractor that uh, we select to actually uh, try again or go um, push back on their subs or go get uh, additional quotes to ensure that we're getting uh, competitive uh, pricing. <clears throat> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so I don't want to hit you with too many of the boring details here, but I have to throw a few in. So. Um, this is the results from the evaluation that we did, and I believe that you guys had uh, some more detailed uh, information in the staff report. Um, again, CMGC is the preferred uh, delivery option for this project. Um, the results we have here are actually specifically tailored to the um, specifically uh, excuse me tailored to the to this project. Every project has different risks, and you end up weighing those out to how each project. Um, uh, fits each delivery method. Uh, for us, um, CMGC scored the highest compared to the other uh, methods. And I do want to point out that we do have cost on there, and that's a little bit of a misnomer. That's cost savings potentials to the district. It's not cost, because the way it would be presented if it was cost would make it look like it's not favorable. So uh, with that being said, uh, there are some legal uh, items that need to be addressed. Um, so we're going to have to go forward with the competitive bidding exemption. Um, 
We believe that the exemption is unlikely to encourage favoritism in awarding the public improvement contracts or substantially diminishing competition for public improvements. Um, awarding a public improvement contract under the exemption will likely result in substantial cost savings and other substantial benefits to the contracting agency. And so we need to ensure that we've addressed uh, these findings. And so we're holding our public hearing now. Um, and we did advertise out to ensure that, you know, we're meeting the minimum requirements for the, uh, the, the public hearing. So how do we ensure that uh, we're going to encourage competition? We actually placed an ad out uh, and we actually reached out to contractors and let them know that we were going, we were interested in pursuing another alternative delivery project. Uh, we solicited, um, a number of firms, we have 12 responses back that actually express, expressed interest in being the CMGC for the project. Um, we already have Keller and Associates um, acting as the consultant for the project. And as I said before, they are going to be or act as the owner's representative uh, to ensure that uh, we deliver the project effectively and we have a second set of eyes ensuring that costs are gonna be uh, reasonable, so. And we are gonna end up using in-house uh, staff for legal assistance, so thank you, Clark. So with that, I guess I'd like to open it up to questions, comments, concerns the board may have. Yes, um, does this mm -hmm. do anything until we connect to the Willamette? Or is it an interim, do the pumps work like to pump up the hill? Uh, before we actually connect to the, the Willamette? Uh, yes, it will. We actually okay. are working on ensuring that we connect to the existing piping system so that we have the operational flexibility to pump from the Willamette supply or from the district uh, system piping, so yes. Uh, Andrew, yes. and also to Carrie, um, I guess we're using this method partially because we had so much success up at Grabhorn kind of worked really well for us. Um, how do you know, maybe after the fact, that this was actually the, the best management technique to use? Maybe not now, but when the project is complete, is there something in your plan that's gonna allow you to assess this? Um, I look at Grabhorn and I look at uh, the extremely small percentage in change orders that we had during the construction process. Uh, all, almost all of those um, were results of um, scope that we, the district, added to the project. It was not uh, after the fact um, changes in materials or other items the contractor did not understand in the bidding process. So there was a very cl uh, clear teaming effort that occurred on that project where Everyone understood what the goals were, and um, in my opinion, there was a reduction in staff time actually uh, um, ensuring that the specifications were met because the contractor uh, helped develop those and understood them uh, at the get-go. So we still had uh, inspections in place, of course, to ensure. Carrie, go ahead. I know Clark's gonna um, probably tell us that um, we actually have to file a report on uh, making sure that we are, have met all of the requirements of um, competitive bidding process exemption. So I don't know the specific um, ORS that requires that. So there is a, after the project is complete, um, to make sure that we actually did what we said. We, the, the, we achieved the objectives that we were seeking to, to meet. In addition to that, um, it, each project obviously gives us um, opportunities to learn from, but at the same time, we look at each of these projects on its own merits, and we look at the reasons for why we want to, um, how to provide delivery. So most of our projects, we go through competitive bidding process because most of them don't pose the risks associated with complexity and different um, aspects of uh, project that that is presented in your staff report that's been included in your um, packet today. And the other thing that I just wanted to highlight is this project is going to not only um, be ready for our reception of the WWSS water, 
but it's actually going to um, be using the water that's coming from JWC and pumping it up to Cooper Mountain Reservoir. That's actually the key reason why we're rushing to do this job or the schedule is so tight on the, on the project because of the necessity for providing resiliency and reliability in the upper Cooper Mountain um, service area. Thank you. Are there any other questions from board members? In that case, I am opening the public hearing on item 2A, acting as the local contract review board, consider adopting resolution number 28-19, declaring an exemption from competitive bidding for the Farmington Road booster pump station and discharge main project and approving a CM <coughs> CMGC delivery method. Public hearing is open. Is there any testimony in support? Is there any testimony in opposition? Public hearing is now closed. Do I have a motion and a second? Oh gosh, I have to read this again. <laughs> Do I have a motion and a second to adopt resolution 28-19, a resolution declaring an exemption from competitive bidding for the Farmington Road booster pump station and discharge main project and authorize proceeding with a construction manager slash general contractor type of contract. I move to approve uh, resolution 2819. I second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Okay. Aye. aye. With no opposed, the motion passes. And there being no further business before the Board of Commissioners, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I so approve.